Well, amen, amen. Well, I don't have to ask you. It is good to be saved. And if it ain't good to be in church, just get out. Man, you don't belong. You don't deserve this. This was good. You, know, I, uh, you hear them saying, and all I think about is getting over there and hearing our God get the praise that he has coming. That is going to be, that is going to be something. It has been an honor, <clears throat> has been an honor for Kathy and I to be here. It really has. I've known your pastor for so many years. I was telling him, I said, you know, when, uh, when we say today, back in the 70s, uh, 19, Um, I said, that is like in the 60s, somebody saying back in the 20s. I just feel wrinkles popping out on my face when I say that. But it is, uh, it is good to be saved, good to be in church, good to be here. Thank you so much for, uh, for letting us uh, to be here. Let me, let me explain something. You know, I'll preach in a different church all the time across the country, around the world. And uh, <clears throat> there's kind of three kind of relationships. Sometimes I come in, I do my job. And I leave, and that's that. Really no relationship with the church, and no relationship with the pastor. Just that's how it is. You're in there for four days. You're not going to be old buddies. Uh, And then there are some churches where um, the pastor is just a good friend. But I don't have that relationship with the church body, all right? And your pastor is a good friend and a a long-time friend. I think I've got to tell you, sometimes it's like when I come in, not not just a friendship with the pastor, but a friendship with the whole church. Uh, I, I, I don't know why I told you that. <laughs> anyway, uh, that, you know, that's, I want to get started here. I, uh, <laughs> I got I to apologize for coughing. I'm coughing. I'm coughing. I, I was afraid I had the flu. I was so afraid I was going to bring the flu into your church. But this morning when I woke up with all those red swollen blotches on my chest and back, Kathy said, that's not the flu. I said, oh, good. good we can go to church. We go to church. Uh, I'm going to do something. I would tell you I never did this before, but I actually did this one time before. <clears throat> Two different things that are not my style. Everybody has a style of preaching. Mine is kind of like listening to the soundtrack of a train wreck. Um, but um, first off, I'm going to read my message tonight. Now, I don't do that. I don't read. I read a lot. I read a lot. But as far as preaching, I don't read my message. Uh, that is a legitimate delivery method. I teach my guys in prep del preparation delivery that uh, that you can do that. You just don't want to bury your nose and it never look up. I've had a couple guys. That's what they do. They I, we have them preaching class and they're going like this. I said, well, that's good, but you have to remember there are people in the room, and um, uh, and so uh, I, I was saved in Canton Baptist Temple. Pastor Harold Henniger read his messages. We used to go down, if you drove around Canton, there at the, what was called the Millet Mall back in that time, and it was about a mile down the road from the Canton Baptist Temple, not far from where he lived, and he would be walking around the outside of that parking lot, and he'd have his message, he'd be reading it, and literally committing portions of it to memory. Some guys memorize their messages, and I don't do that, I don't have the, I don't have the memory for that, I'm still working on Jesus Cried, but... Um, <laughs> Um, but I'm going to read my message tonight with some running commentary. The second part about this, which is very strange, is this is not my message. This isn't even a sermon that I am aware of. In our church, in our track rack, we have that little, that little pamphlet. My pastor, Brother Michael, found this. I said, where did you find this? And he said... Um, he said, I found that in a magazine, some Christian publication some, some, some years ago. And he said, it's so, it's so, so taken by it because it sounds like he wrote it. I thought he wrote it when I read it. And he says that um, it was so good that I wrote to him and asked him permission to put it in track form. So we put it in our church and he got, he got it all cleared and everything. So unfortunately, I can't take credit. I would if I could. But um, it's, you know, this morning we talked about a word vision. And I think if you could leave and close this, this conference, this 40th anniversary conference, with two words, it would be, still church. So I'm going to read this because it is just, I, I, it describes the church where I come from, and I think it well describes this church, all right? I want you to go to Galatians chapter 1. 
Galatians chapter 1. And Paul says this in verse 1. Paul, an apostle, not of men, neither by man, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father, who raised him from the dead, and all the brethren, which are with me unto the churches of Galatia. Let's bow our heads and we'll talk to the Lord. Father, we thank you now, God, for your goodness. God, God, I look forward to the day when we are in glory and we hear voices join themselves like we heard tonight. And it is you because you are worthy. Lord, to hear you get the praise from your creation as you deserve, as you are so worthy. God, it is, uh, it is just going to be awesome. It's going to be phenomenal. We get to spend eternity with you. So I thank you for that. Thank you, God, what we got when we got saved. You've been uh, beyond good, beyond kind, beyond merciful. And Lord, these folks, some of these folks have been here almost from day one of this church. They have waited and longed for you to return. And every day that you didn't, and every Sunday that you didn't, you allowed them to be here. Thank you for that. Now, God, this is the last message of the day and the last message of this conference It is not the last of this church. They still have a ministry. And they begin just a brand new decade for you. Lord God, if you're not going to come in the next 10 years, and I sure hope that's not true, let these people be faithful to you and faithful to this church. God, let us all live that we would, if we would just live so that when somebody saw us, they would say something good about you, then we will have done something well. God, please, this is not my style. So I'm asking you, Father, to please uh, help here and present this message to these people that they could get this and uh, just get a hold of it and never let go. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Now, I said this morning, <coughs> we looked at 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 32, uh, about the Jew, the Gentile, and the church of God. Uh, and I said that if you're saved, you're in the church uh, the church of God, you can call it that, you can call it the body of Christ, you can call it the bride of Christ, call it anything you want, I'm in, okay, I'm in, so are you. Uh, and you say, well, you can't believe in that. Well, I do, because I got scripture for it. Well, then you can't believe that and local churches. Doesn't it say the churches, plural, of Galatia? This is not talking about the church of Galatia, the, the, the born again believers, but the local churches of Galatia. And let me tell you this, I am a local church evangelist. Uh, there are several cities in our country where I preach probably in maybe a half a dozen different churches in, the, in, a, in a large metropolitan area. Uh, and I've had people say, uh, and it would, be, it would be easier, I guess, it would be to my advantage. Uh, they say, why don't you, instead of going to this church and this church and this church and this church and this church, why don't you have them all get like a civil, civic center, civil auditorium, you know, uh, have a, 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 a united service of all those churches. And they're all Bible believers are like this one, okay? Um, and I thought, well, you know, that would be nice. I'd get all five, six churches at one week, uh, and it would open up my, my uh, schedule for some other churches. I think that's a great idea. Just couldn't do it. Say, why? I, it's something about being in a local church. I like a local church. And I've had people say, well, you know, God is done with the local church. Like, what? He, he told you that last night? I mean, really, you know. I was really, you know, I heard last night he was going to my bedroom. He's done with the local church. And uh, one of the things that I point out, people, I write books. And if you write, you know, you can start at a point uh, and then you may go out many directions. But you can't leave it all hang out here when you finish. When you get to the last chapter, you got to bring all these loose ends in and to a focus, correct? So when you get to the end of a book, you got to have it all together. God wrote this book. What's the last book of the Bible? What it? You mean it's not concordance? In my book, well, that, that blew my message right there. No, um, it is. Revelation is the last book of the Bible. And when you get to the book of Revelation, chapters 1, 2, and 3, you know what God's dealing with? Seven local churches. So I have biblical proof that when this thing does wrap up, be it today, be it next year, be it 10 years from now, when this whole thing wraps up, he is still going to be dealing with local churches like this one. And could I just head somebody off here? I don't think there's any disgruntled people here, but people sometimes get this idea. You know, they get mad at their church. They say, I love my church. What's he get mad at the pastor? 
And it's funny how people say that church is the Lord's church. And then as soon as they get mad at the pastor, they want to do everything they can to damage the Lord's church. And, uh, and they go, well, I'll leave there, brother, and it'll fold up. And you leave and they add a new wing. <laughs> and um, I've had so many people, they, they really do. They think, boy, this church is going to pay because I left. No, no, you will pay. And your family will pay. It doesn't matter. Look, guys, you need a local church. You ought to thank God. If I could do backflips, I would do backflips for being a member of a good local church, okay? And so here he's dealing with local churches. He's going to be dealing with them until the very end. Now, uh, it was read earlier, but go back to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. Verse 11. You heard this earlier, it said, and he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. And, and before I read the next verse, there is a, a misconception that God put the local church here so he could bring lost people in to get them saved. Now, I got no problem with that. I got saved. I came into a church like this with lost. I told you, they gave the invitation in the service. I came down to the altar. I got saved. Some of you did that, correct? But look what he put the church here for. For the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. So, guys, this church was put here for God's people. We don't mind. I don't mind, you know, uh, if, if lost people come in. But, you know, somebody got this idea in the, in the head of some Christians that it's all about getting as many lost people in your church as you can. And Rick Warren took that to the next step and said, you want to get lost folks? I'll show you how to get them. Play their music and have their standards. And so the church is for the edifying. That's why you people like it here. You know, I, I was blessed last night uh, after the service. You know, sometimes people, I, I preach, uh, you know, they, I, I, I was so blessed every time somebody said about Pastor Sal, he preaches long. Glory to God. Glory to God. Man, I get so tired of that short stuff, you know. And, uh, and I, I tend to preach long. It, it's just one of those things. But, and then go, there's always this parent. And they never, you ever notice like when the news media wants to lie, they always go, they always blame somebody else. Well, the people have a right to know. And they'll go, well, the children, you know, the children have to go to bed. Hey, look, they don't go to bed as soon as you get home. They're going to watch TV and eat a snack anyway. Hey, here's what's really, you know, you're in a good church. When the service goes long, and an hour after the amen and it's closed, there are people still milling around talking to each other and have fellowship. That's when you're home, you understand? I saw that. I saw that in your church every time I come. That is a good sign. I have been in churches, brother, that when you say amen, it echoed. <laughs> I mean, it was the Baptist 500 out of the parking lot, brother. You step out there, they'll run over you. They're headed for the restaurant. And I mean, within, I'm serious, I've been, I've been in some church within 10 minutes, brother, the building is empty. It is empty. And that is not here. That is the sign. That when, it, when people hang around and just enjoy being here and fellowship, that is a sign of a good, healthy, living church. You've got them. You've got it, all right? That's why don't leave here. Don't leave here. Don't get upset and leave. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to look at this because... Um, this, uh, I think this describes your church. It's got six points. It's all laid out. Uh, I, I'm, just, uh, I'm just amazed that the, the guy put this together. Whoever it was, uh, I'll meet him in glory. But here's what it says when it says still church. Because if you could define this church as church, isn't it nice to know it's still church? Still sing out of a hymnal. Still have a Bible. Still dress like you're going someplace special. Still sing. Songs that, that elevate and glorify God instead of talking about man. Did you ever think about this? I don't know if you're Americans. I don't know if you ever thought. But <laughs> people, we and God do not think the same, correct? I mean, we have different values. We have totally different values. We, don't even, we can't even conceive of how God thinks, correct? So if we don't think like God, when they make the service so the music is for the people and the message is for the people and the dress standards for the people, there is no way it can please God. There, it's impossible. If you are aiming to please the people in the pew, there is no way you can please the God in heaven. So there ought to be something here that, well, you know, I'm, you ever, yeah, I've had people say, well, we sing those hymns, you know, visitors feel uncomfortable. They should feel uncomfortable. 
Yeah, they should feel uncomfortable. Man, when I first went to a church, lost drunken Roman Catholic, I felt real uncomfortable. And say, oh, and then did they change the church for you? No, they changed me for the church. <laughs> That's how it used to be. We came in, we came in and we changed to fit in. We found out what we had to change about us to fit in there. Now they changed the church to please the people and God is left out. And so it's still church. First off, it says this. Tell me if this is not your church. It is still preaching. It is still preaching. Dynamic, passionate, preaching straight from the Bible still brings more lasting change than videos, uh, comedy routines, drama, and motivational talks. It's still preaching. I had a meeting one time in a church. (coughs) It was a Sunday through Friday. And uh, Friday night, we're going into the the, the church. The pastor says, you know, I forgot to tell you, but when we have a Sunday through Friday meeting, uh, on Friday, we sing for an hour and a half. Do you mind? I said, no, as long as you don't mind if I preach for an hour and a half. I really don't mind. I said, look, because I said, if you want out early, cut your singing. You're not cutting the preaching. And I can't get over it. You know, these people, they'll have a song service, you know, go for 40, 50 minutes. And then the preacher will preach and I go, he preached too long. Why didn't they sing too long? Guys, it is all about preaching. It is all about preaching. Preaching is what changes lives. Preaching is what God chose to touch the hearts of man, to save the lost. That's why you want a King James Bible. You know what the Bible says? The Bible says in 1 Corinthians, God chose the foolishness of preaching. Go to a new King James and it says, God chose the foolishness of what's preached. Whoa, whoa, whoa. I don't know if I want to call the cross foolish. I don't, I don't think I want to call... You, you're talking about the beating of God himself with a, with a whip. You're talking about a crown of thorns jammed into his head. You're talking about somebody punching him. You're talking about him being hanging on a cross. That that's foolish. You better watch yourself, bucko. It is not what we preach that is foolish. It is that we preach. You know why, you know why preaching is foolish? Let me explain something. And I'm not making a joke here. But your pastor has something in common with Adolf Hitler, Joseph Stalin... And Saddam Hussein. Yeah, that's what I've always thought. Anyway, um, <laughs> you know what those four men have in common? All four of them want to make people live the way they think they should live. Now, I know those first three are dead. So now they're Bible believers. But let's just say that, that like Hussein was still around here and your pastor could have an audience with Saddam Hussein. And Hussein says, uh, it says here you're having trouble getting people to do what you want them to do. Uh, what kind of gun are you using? Your pastor go, oh, oh, oh no, 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 I'm not, I'm not, I'm not using a gun. I'm not using, oh, yeah, cattle prods work for me too. Well, well, no, 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 we don't use cattle prods. Well, what size are your torture rooms? Well, we don't, we don't have torture rooms. Well, how are you, how are you trying to get them to do what you want? Well, I, I, uh, I, I stand in front of him and I yell at him. You know, do you know what all three of those first guys would say? That's foolish. <laughs> Get a gun and make them do it. You got a jerk in Congress today that said they ought to raise taxes on meat because he thinks there ought to, nobody ought to eat meat. He thinks that if you, he's going to force you to do what his will is. Isn't that true? He, he thinks preaching is foolish because it is. But it is still preaching. Preaching is simply a passionate and dynamic communication of an important and vital truth from the Bible. That is what preaching is. It is passionate. It is dynamic. You don't have to have it uh, a drama. I mean, when you have to have a drama, you know what it tells you? The preacher's dead as a fish. That preacher has got no personality. He's got to have some kind of an actor up here. And they all got to cry at the right place and, and, and laugh at the right place and have some little, some little theater. Do you ever stop and think about this? There was a day when we used to preach against the theater, and now churches have become the theater. Aren't you glad this isn't a theater? Aren't you glad it's still church? The preaching you hear will first be uh, all Bible-centered. We still believe, tell me if you can sign on to this, we still believe in the absolute truth of the time-tested Word of God. Not some book report, not some guy getting up and, and, and uh, giving some tear-jerking story. You guys come here. Look, when this pulpit is not on fire from the Word of God, you people will not want to come here. You will go find some place where they open up the Bible. And here's how I say it, guys. What you need to do is just come to church, sit where you are, let somebody get behind this pulpit, open up this Bible, and rip your face off. 
I had somebody say this one time. I told me I'll to go to church. They said, I went to church. And the preacher made me mad. I said, well, did you thank him? Brother, you ought, to, you ought to thank somebody that makes you mad. Come on, man. Some of the best news you got was some of the worst news you got. You know, in 1973, I was working on a house. I just graduated from Bible college. <clears throat> Two weeks earlier, my wife and I just celebrated our first anniversary. I'm working on a building, did a back swan dive, two floors into the basement. I broke my neck. I didn't know it. My doctor was that doctor you heard all the jokes about. He was practicing medicine because he had not perfected it. And, and, um, and so I kept going back to him. I, I said, Doc, my, my neck hurts. My, my, uh, my arms hurt. My arms go numb on me. And he thought it was in my head. And I knew it was a little lower. And um, after four times there, I finally told Kathy, I said, come on, babe. I said, we're going to a chiropractor. He'll snap my neck and I'll be okay. And he x-rayed me. That saved my life. And after x-raying me, I walk into his examining room and he goes, uh, you got a broken neck. And I said, oh, you're too negative. <laughs> he said, you got a broken neck. I said, you know, you shouldn't, you shouldn't say harsh things like that. That's very offensive. You should say something nice, something soft. Like most of my neck is really good. <laughs> I wonder how many people are sitting here right now cancer free because you heard from a doctor you had cancer. Is there, any, is there a line forming anywhere? Stand here if you want to have a doctor tell you you have cancer. I don't know anybody getting in that line as fast as they can. But have you ever been in that line? I was in that line. Guy, man, I had cancer right here. And, and he, uh, he called me up. He, he, I went in, you know, and he cut this little football out. Like, because I'm from Maslin. <laughs> I said, no soccer ball. <laughs> and so he cut this little football out. And he says, well, it's basal cell, and you get that, you know. And, and it was in April of the year. <coughs> and, uh, and so I leave, man, because, I mean, when we get done, brother, we are gear up and out of town. And uh, he called me three days later, and, and I'm like 300 miles away from him with my back to him. And he goes, you got to come back. I said, I can't come back. He says, no, no, you got to come back. I said, I can't come back, doc. I said, I'm heading for a meeting. He said, well, you understand, he said, that's not basal cell cancer. This is serious cancer. And he said, because I cut this football, I left cancer at 3 and 9 o'clock because I thought that basal cell would naturally die, but this isn't going to die. You will. And I said, well, I can't get back. And it was like three months later before he went back in and, uh, and did it again. But guys, does anybody want to hear you have cancer? No. And yet that is why some of you are alive. When you, come into, when you come into church, listen, if your pastor hasn't made you mad, check your Check your pulse. One of you guys is dead. Second, it will be relevant and clear. Don't you like preaching this clear? You know, I, uh, I back, it was back in, uh, it was 87. And I was, uh, I was preaching in a church uh, in, in uh, Colorado. And one of my students, uh, earlier students from Masson, was uh, on the staff there. And we were having, we were having supper. And we're in a restaurant. <coughs> and he said, um, I know you're a writer, and he said, I, uh, I wrote something. I want you to read it for me, and tell me what you think. Now, that last sentence is really dangerous ground, okay? When you say, tell me what you think, don't ask, don't ask a question that you don't want to hear the answer of. And so I said, okay, so I'll take it to my room tonight, and I'll read it. And so I took it, he says, and it was, he wrote something on prayer. And here's what he's equating prayer to. He's equating prayer to workout, you know, working out. And if you're not working out, you don't start by saying, you know, I'm going to start working out. Uh, I think I'll jog 20 miles today. Oh, no, no, not if you're not, if you're not, not a runner, you're not going to start by running 20 miles. I think I'll start by uh, benching 200 pounds. No, so you're not going to do that. In fact, I don't care how you work out. He'd say, you have to kind of warm up, stretch the muscles, get, get ready. You know, you actually, you kind of get re- prepared for this workout. And so I, I read this whole thing and we had breakfast and he said, well, you read it? I said, yes, sir. He said, what'd you think? I said, well, till I read this, I thought I knew how to pray. Now, guys, there are some things in the Christian life that are difficult. Prayer is not one of them. It, I told him, I said, what is easier than talking to your father? I said, I said, you took the simplest thing in Christianity and found a way to make it difficult. I said, that's what we have government for. <laughs> I said, he is no friend who takes the simple and makes it difficult. You are somebody's friend if you take the difficult and make it simple. 
And when a preacher can come to a pulpit and give you some profound truth, and I know your pastor has done it many times, he he can come to this pulpit and give you some profound Bible truth, and you can walk away saying, man, I never got it so clear. I understand it now. That's what you get here. That's what preaching is. That's not true. You won't wonder what the point was, and you'll be able to use it immediately. (laughs) That's right. Man, you listen, I bet you never walked out of here. I actually had this happen. This, uh, uh, I was at a conference and this guy got done preaching and it was really kind of like, uh, well, I, I preached before this guy and then this guy preached and then Dr. Ruckman was, was preaching. And this young guy was preaching before Dr. Ruckman and you could tell he was just all aglow because he was the, the lead in guy for Dr. Ruckman. He was so excited. He preached, 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 preached 20 minutes into Doc's time. So Doc and I are going to lunch afterwards, and I thought, he's a young guy. I'm not going to say anything about him. I'm not going to point anything out. Doc gets in the car, the door closes, and he goes, because I've been preaching uh, in mine. I talk about the, the, the uh, Jews, 40 years in the wilderness. And he closes the door, and he goes, well, man, how's that for 40 years in the wilderness? <laughs> <laughs> I heard a guy preach one time, and when it was all over, this guy said, could you just do me one favor? We, were, we, we got a loan. You got me a loan. I said, sure. He said, could you tell me what he, was, what he said? Brother, when a guy gets up, it's kind of like Lyndon Johnson making an announcement. <laughs> if you remember Lyndon Johnson, I was lost. And I, I was still interested in politics. And I would, I, would watch, I would watch him on TV. And I'd watch his mouth because I thought if I can watch the words come out of his mouth, maybe I'll understand them. <laughs> and here's what he would say. He'd say, my, my, my fellow Americans. I'll come to you tonight with a heavy heart. And he's done. You will not understand another sentence of what he's going to say for the next 45 minutes. I would look at him. I, would, I said, can't they put the words up? I, I, I want to see. I can, I can get it. Well, that don't happen here. You need to come in here and get it straight. And if you get it straight, you're going to get mad. But some of you, the biggest change in your life spiritually happened right after you got mad. <coughs> Pastor Cummins made me mad. He was my pastor when I was down at Maslin, and he was preaching one night, and he, he made me mad. He was talking about, now guys, you know I'm talking about reading the Bible, read the Bible, read the Bible, read the Bible. And, uh, and I tell people, read 10 pages a day, and he didn't. He said, read it for half an hour a day. Well, this is a statistic that is not my statistic. This is a general, well-known statistic that the average person can read a page of the Bible in three minutes. That's all it takes to read one page of the Bible. That's if you're not spending 45 minutes trying to figure out what music you want to listen to. And what color the lights have to be flashing, you know. But anyway, so so guys, three minutes a page, ten pages, that's half an hour. Okay, now, please, please, when I'm done here, don't come up to me. When I say say the average guy can read a page in three minutes, don't come up after church and go, I can't, because I'll believe you. And he's reading, and he says, uh, you ought to read the Bible for 30 minutes every day. And I said uh, to myself, because it's always smart if you're going to say something stupid, say it to yourself. And I said, did I tell you this the other day yet? Oh, I did? <laughs> Who are you people? <laughs> Look, the last thing I remembered, they said, get off the spacecraft. <laughs> We've had you long enough. Okay, this is what happens when you preach someplace different every week. You don't know if you said it here or there, okay? All right, anyway, so I'm sorry, Pastor Smith. It's, uh... But here in Kansas, but yeah, man, so he got up there and he said, uh, you know, he said, read 30 minutes every day. I said, I don't have time to read 30 minutes every day. Man, he made me mad. But I, I set my alarm 30 minutes early and started reading my Bible 10 pages every day. You need to come in here and get it straight. It will be passionate. Can you please listen to this next word? And unapologetic. Our country is now run by overbearing women and effeminate men. That is all that this country is run by. It is run by a bunch of women who push everybody around and and a bunch of men who are trying to not make those women mad. Now, lady, don't come up after this service and tell me I'm wrong because I'll know. Send that worm of a husband up and have him tell me, and I'll still know. 
You get up there and tell him. I'm... Preacher, you knew Buddy Cargill, right? Buddy Cargill was no biker, got saved. He didn't get completely saved, but he got mostly saved. <laughs> and he had a lady in his church that was just, uh, you know, she wasn't gospel, but man, she had some prayer requests that were just tearing the place up. And, and he walked out of the pulpit one day, and this guy sitting here, this little, you know, and, and she's sitting here, and he looks, he bends over this guy and he says, she better shut her mouth or I am going to whip you. <laughs> oh, I didn't think you should talk that way. That's because you're a woman. No, I'm a man. Well, then you're trying to be a woman or you're trying to please a woman. Good night. Come on, guys. Do you not remember a time somebody said something or did something that made you mad and it didn't even mean nothing? How many of you guys, who I don't know if I should say this. I'm going to put my hand up on this. How many of you guys ever got in a fight with somebody and after the fight ended up being good friends with the person you were in a fight with? Now you say something and a man, when a man walks up and goes, you said something that offended me. I just want to rip off his skirt. Oh, I'm going to say something. I don't know if I can say, but I'm going to say it. I, uh, I was preaching one time and I used the word queer. And um, <coughs> I won't say it today. I was just telling you that I did. <laughs> and so after church, this lady's come, she's walking out and she was like this. She said, you said queer. <laughs> I said, I'm glad you were listening. It's always nice to know they're tuned in. She said, we have to love them. I said, you love them. I said, I don't have to love him. I said, God loved him enough for his son to die for him. If that ain't enough for him, they're in bad shape. And, and, and so she's trying and trying and trying to get me. And I can't catch fish. I'm not a good fisherman, okay? I mean, I think I got my problem down. Next time I go fishing, I'm going to light the bait before I throw it in the water. But, um, <laughs> but I, I can catch people. Oh, man, I'm good at catching people. And I'm, I'm, I'm going to get her. And she, I, she finally bit. And she said... Well, we have to have grace with them. I said, oh. I said, we have to have grace with them. Yes. I said, I think you're right. Well, she was so glad I said that. I said, lady, I said, look at this. I said, you know what this is? That's queer. I said, do you know what they do? Yes. I said, is it bad? Oh, oh, yes. I said, is it very, very bad? Oh, yes, it's very bad. I said, lady, this ain't me. I said, this is me over here. I said, I'm not one of these. But I say queer. Am I wrong? Oh, yes. I said, so they're wrong and I'm wrong, right? Yes. I said, but I'm wrong here, and they're very wrong in a bunch of places, right? Oh, yes. Are they more wrong than me? Yes. I said, okay. And you have grace with them? Yes. I said, I demand the same grace. Because I'm not a runner, but I'll bet if you run a marathon, a hundred-yard dash ought not to win to you. And if you can have grace with all these horrible things that people have, I, I can't understand why you don't have grace with somebody like me. Well, I just think you're wrong. Well, so, okay, so I'm wrong. Let me alone. Oh, but I just, I, I just think you're so wrong. Ah, oh, just go watch a soap opera or something. I mean, good night. Give me a break. In a culture of believe whatever you want, regardless of whether it is actually true. Preaching might seem offensive to sensitive ears. Rather than water it down and mix it with entertainment, we still believe in the, that timeless biblical practice called preaching. Is that not your church? Yeah. Whoever wrote this man is thinking about you guys. I was preaching one time up in Minneapolis. And I, I said this. I know it's hard for you to believe that I would say things that are offensive. <laughs> and I said, um, I wouldn't want a religion that thinks that cutting somebody's head off is a virtuous act. Or that uh, blowing up kids on a school bus is a, is a good thing you do for God. Now, you know who I'm talking about? And this lady puts her hand up and said, that's not so. Now, let me explain something. Never interrupt a preacher. I just don't believe you should ever interrupt. I don't care if he's correct in the Bible or anything else. If you can't take it, just get out. Just get up and walk out. If you can, sit there and take it. If you can't, get out. But you don't interrupt a preacher. If you, well, I'm just trying to interact. Then say amen and give money. You, you, you're part of the service? Interact? Okay, say amen and give money. That's how you interact. And, uh, and, if you inter and I've told my young men, I tell my guys, don't you ever interrupt a preacher. 
And she made the mistake of interrupting a preacher. And I was the preacher. And that day, she found out where Jimmy Hoffa is. <laughs> they still haven't found her body. <laughs> but I did. I mean, I just went up one side and down the other. So, oh, you're real tough with a woman. Look, I don't pick on women. I wouldn't shoot a woman. But if she had a rifle and took a shot at me, different rules. And lady, I got news for you. You can say, say something while I'm preaching. And I'll treat you just like the man you want to be. And so, um, and so I, just, I just nailed her. But here's the amazing thing. What was amazing is what she told the pastor afterwards. She was a visitor and saved. And she told the pastor this. I knew what he said was right. But it just hurt the human family. What she was saying was what the Bible says. Please give us a smooth lie. Instead of a harsh truth. Aren't you glad you people come to a church and you get some harsh truth? Guys, how can you, you want it, you want it unapologetic? You, you want it, and somebody comes in like you came the other day and, and you, go, you, you sit around and listen to a book that says you're desperately wicked. That the best you can do is altogether vanity. That you're born to trouble as the sparks fly upward. You come here of your own free will and you hear that and you don't want to be offended. Man, listen, that's what you need to hear. The world is the one that's going to tell you, you're very important. You're a champion. You're not a champion. You're a champion. Point two. That's, that's just point one. We, no, we, actually, we've got 25 points here. Uh, one of the points is it's long and exhaustive. Anyway, <coughs> it's still church. One is it's still preach. Number two, it's still men. The rumor that masculine men hate church isn't entirely true, isn't true at all. Our church is called a man's church. Would you not use that to describe this church? Quite often because of the generous involvement of men in every facet. We still uh, still believe strong leadership within the church. uh, I'm sorry. uh, We still believe men are expected to provide strong leadership within the church and their homes. Generation of that kind of leadership is one secret. To America's greatness. You know, guys, all you have to know if you want to find out who the enemy is, is listen to who they're after. And who do the liberals hate? Well, they tell you you ought to hate somebody white. And you ought to hate somebody that's a man. And you ought to hate somebody that's not old and not young. Say, who are you talking about? I think I just nailed Ben Franklin, uh, George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, Alexander Hamilton. I think we just got every the founders, every one of the founders of this country. These people have hated men for as long as they can stand it. I'm sorry, ladies. Look, we are different, okay? We are not! That's what I mean. (laughs) And, you know, I hear this from women. I, I hear this. Well, you men just don't have any compassion. You are right. You have compassion. Ladies, have compassion, okay? I mean, when somebody falls down, somebody's got to care. I don't. You say, well, why are you like that? Because God made men to go out and kill people. God made men so they would go out to battle and kill the people who want to come and hurt their families. It's hard to do that and then cry over everybody that you kill. Oh, I don't want to hear this. That's because you're, you're an overbearing woman or feminine man. I am telling you, God, gave, God did not give us the compassion you women have, okay? Here's how this works. Let me tell you what's happened in this country. Here's Junior. He's going to go in and play football. I said football. Here's what Dad says. Son, get in there and hit him hard. Hurt him. Make him cry. Here's Mom. Honey, honey, you don't hit him so hard because if, if you hit him too hard, uh, that you might hurt somebody and then you'll feel bad. You know who's right? Both of them. Absolutely. That is both of them. That's the way the old man ought to feel. And who would want a mother that felt that way? (laughs) Oh, you fell down and broke your leg? Well, you still got a good one. (laughs) Let me alone. I got to go cook supper. After I hunt it and kill it and skin it. But here's what happens. Junior goes into the game. 
Then mom turns to the dad and says, now you shouldn't say those things to him because he's going to hurt somebody and then you're going to feel bad. And he says, you're right, honey, I'm sorry. That's when he just lost his masculinity. We now have a nation that, that is mad because men will not think like women. We will not apologize. We, we just say it because that's how it is. And it is offensive to women. I am sorry, ladies. I re- hear that? I said, I'm sorry. I am sorry that, that what I say is offensive to you. But if it isn't, I won't be a man anymore. It has got to be offensive. I'm sorry. I'm not trying to make it offensive. Part of the strong bond among our men is from our weekly men's prayer meeting. It says here we're 80. I don't know where this church is. We're 80 or more men uh, and their sons meet. Oh, man, we have, a, we have a men's prayer meeting every Saturday night over at Treasure Valley. One of the biggest blessings I have is watching fathers bring their kids in. They bring their sons in. I watched a father one time give his two-year-old son beer when I was lost. Are you going to say that? I taught my boy how to drink. And here's fathers bringing their, their sons in to church, show them how to pray. Is there anybody, you know, I said this the other day. Is there anybody would like to walk in here and say there's no men in here? I, I would like to walk up to, to, to Todd Ogle. Yeah, you know, this is just a woman's church, isn't it? And if you don't believe me, ask Wrecked. And you look like Swiss cheese. Isn't that right? Man, you know, uh, I, I'm sure your pastors talked about uh, Jack Wood. Jack Wood is an old cowboy preacher down in Houston. And, and there, was a, uh, there were two guys that were coming into churches, and they'd sit on the center row, back, row, back pew, and they'd wait till the offering got there, and they'd pull guns, and they'd take the offering. And one Sunday morning, just before the offering, two guys walked in, sat right back there. And Jack Wood, he had a way of dealing with that. He said, now, uh, before I take this offering... How many of you men here are packing and prepared to use it? Stand up. (laughs) Okay, sit back down. (laughs) They had prayer and there was a select rapture because both those guys disappeared during the prayer. (laughs) Now, here's what you don't understand about Jack Woods Church. He didn't ask the women that were packing. I mean, I mean, it would have been, it would have been, bam, bam, bam. Some women walk up, let me get a shot in. Pew, pew. <laughs> I just preached in a church. Guys, I just preached in a church where I met 86-year-old Mildred. Mildred. When her church got a new pastor, she says, I only have one question, pastor. Can I still pack my gun? She teaches gun safety courses at 86. So what do you think of that? I think that when her grandkids come over, they all eat their vegetables. That's what I think. (laughs) Saturday evening is to pray for missionaries, our church, and their families. So if it's still church, it's still preaching, it's still men, it's still hymns. Most church music amounts to dump, dumbing down the lyrics and cranking up the volume to build interest. Have you noticed that church doesn't sound like church anymore? The latest music trends rule the pew and no one really knows where it will stop. You know, I was reading a book by Ruckman. I'd just gotten saved. It was 1970. I think it was the Bible babble. And uh, I tell people, I said, I don't think the guy's a prophet, but the world makes him look like one. Uh, He says in this book that was written in the late 60s, he said, one of these days there will be a national anti-smoking campaign not based against uh, against smoking because of sin, but because of health. And I thought, okay, that'll never happen. Then he said, one of these days they will be playing rock and roll music and dancing in the churches. And I said, all right, that'll never happen. And they started with Christian rock. Now they don't even bother with that. They just play whatever out there. Look, I know, I know that, that they use rock music. And I just want you to know that if you think you can worship God with that, you're a liar. You are an absolute liar. You're not even deceived. You're lying. I was preaching in California, L.A. area, staying in a hotel, third floor up. And uh, you know how the first floor, a lot of times, will have conference rooms. And so I just got done with the morning service, and I'm walking down the hall to the elevator. And one of those contemporary churches was, 
was renting a conference room. I said, I know, I know in my mind, I know that they use rock music. But when you're standing right here, and there's the wall, and on the other side, the band, I mean the drums, and the rock music is absolutely rattling the windows. I could still hear it when I got up to my room, three floors away. I stood on that side of the door. I won't mess up with their service. But I said, you can't, there's nobody on the other side of this wall that could possibly really pretend that they believe they're worshiping God. How are you going to compare to what you heard tonight? I had somebody say this, but I like that kind of music. Well, who said you should listen to music you like? Well, you, you, you're, a, you're a rotten sinner. Why do you think something you like could glorify God? Look, there's a question. I'm not seeking the answer. I have a question. I plan on dying with this question unanswered, okay? Because I don't know the answer. I don't know the answer to this question. Maybe... I still like the taste of beer. I quit drinking it almost 50 years ago when I got saved. I didn't quit drinking it because I didn't like it anymore. I quit drinking it because a Christian shouldn't have it. And if you're drinking it, knock it off. And don't give this lame excuse you got for why you do it. What I'm saying is, I didn't quit drinking because I didn't like it anymore. Because if that's the reason, I wouldn't have been quitting for him. I'd been quitting for myself. And I got rid of the music too. I didn't say I didn't like it. I said I got rid of it because it doesn't glorify him. There's no rock song out there that glorifies him. But aren't you glad you come in here and you hear God uplifted? Man, that worthy is the lamb because he is so worthy. The latest, uh, I'm sorry, uh, if today's church includes a hymn, it has to be reworked in modern rock to be accepted. How many of you have noticed this? When they bring out these new songs and they're kind of rocky or something, they always have to throw in about three lines of a hymn. You know why they're doing that? Because they're trying to take their modern garbage and connect it to something like Amazing Grace. I've heard them. They play some kind of a, you know, they got, and they're all, you know what those songs are all about. Me and Jesus and a cup of coffee. I felt bad about myself. And then Jesus came by and we had a cup of coffee. And he told me I was important. (laughs) And now I know I'm important. And I feel good about myself. I'm telling you. And so, and then, and then it'll morph into amazing. Well, look how they put those two together. That's like sand in your gravy. (laughs) Guys. It ain't God. Tell me if this is you. We still believe the hymn is the most most truthful and exciting form of music used in the church. Where it is appreciated, it is not boring. Oh, I've been in some churches, brother, where they, you know, they they had the song service and, and you get somebody that cannot lead. You guys have never had that problem. But boy, you get somebody that cannot lead. I was in this church one time. Is, is in, it was in Cincinnati, okay? And the only problem with Cincinnati is it is so close to Kentucky that sometimes... <laughs> sometimes the escapees. <laughs> and so, so we're sitting there. I'm going I'm to preach this meeting. I got all five of the kids, or three of the kids, five, five of us there. And first off, the guy played the organ and he played well. He only had two problems. He played at his own pace and never looked up. So, so he would be playing, you know, victory in Jesus. That's how I play. Never look up. The pastor's leading, and he knows that if you want to sing faster, you lead faster. So he's up here stirring peanut butter. <laughs> victory. In Jesus. He didn't understand it. I'm watching. Then they had this lady that they must just put shoes on her to bring her to church. And she got up from some mountaintop in, in Kentucky and she says, And now, 
am on a sign, amazing grace, which is very similar to our Christian hymn, Amazing Grace. <laughs> and she starts sounding off, brother. I mean, it was nothing. You, you know, what do you call it? You know, I mean, chalk on the chalkboard. I mean, glass is shattering. Babies are crying. You know, the whole, the whole nine yards. And, and she also memorized every single verse. But the act ain't over yet. While this has gone on, oh, she's about two verses in, and the guy with the organ, she's doing this acapella, gets up, walks across front of the church, sits down at the piano, and decides, I'm going to pick up an accompanier. And he can't. So the rest of it is like this him going, ding, ding, ding. Did it? Did it? And I thought, I was so glad to be there. I really was. I really was. Honest, I'm telling you the truth. Because usually you got to pay for a show like that. This was absolutely free. I'm getting paid to be there. In fact, you'd have to pay me to go to that. Well, somewhere around verse 57, the piano player's wife just gets up. And walks over and stands next to the piano while he's playing. She just stands here like this in her brand new sweatshirt, bobby socks and saddle loafers. And she's standing like this. I thought, what? I said to God, I said, what's her part in this act? <laughs> well, I said, I'm serious. I said, God, what has she got here? You know, is she going to juggle? <laughs> well, when this woman, they finally, Shepherd hooked her off the platform. <laughs> it's her turn to sing. And I don't know a lot about music. You probably noticed if you sat anywhere near where I'm singing. And she started singing. And I said, I'm, I'm, I spent a lot of time in prayer in this church. And I said this to God. I said, uh, you know, God, I don't know a lot about, about, about music. But I said, this looks like one of those women that would uh, sing a song with a note higher than she can hit. And I think this might be that one of those songs. She was singing Stranger of Galilee. And I felt I could love him for, ah! and when she hit that, it was over. Now, I am the guy, you know, you know, like you ever get a, like you start laughing at a funeral <laughs> or you're laughing in church when nobody else is. That's me. So something will happen and I'll get tickled and beside me will be my wife and the three boys and they're all trying to sit right next to me and act like they don't know me. Oh, not this day. Oh, no. No, sir. On this day, the guest evangelist and his wife and all three little Gippites were howling. I mean, we are bent over howling. Now, think about this. You have this guy come in to preach, and he's, he's bent over tears, you know. And, and, then, and then we don't go like this. We, we get up and go, no, no, no. you know, think about something. Think about something like, like kissing Hillary or something. And we'd stop, we'd stop. And all of a sudden, what would we go? Oh, and off we'd go again. <laughs> no. Somebody says, well, I think some of that stuff's boring. Well, I've heard it when it's boring. I'll bet you have never described a song service in this church as boring. I'll bet you said they've been uplifting. I'll bet you said they've glorified God. I'll bet you said they touched your heart. I'll bet some of you came away crying when you heard them. Isn't that not true? Still hymns. It's still relevant. Casual is all the rage in American institutions, but God deserves better. American culture has become obsessed with the casual, which has invaded every major institution, including schools, businesses, and courtrooms. To which I added here, but not ESPN. Could you, could you explain to me why the guys that announce sporting venues have more convictions about how they dress than some guys in our churches. You know, I, I told you, you know, I come from another age, the stone, I think it's called, but uh, you know what we had when I was a kid? We had three kinds of clothes. We went to school every day. We wore school clothes. You didn't play in school clothes. You don't put no hole in them knees in school clothes. You played, you went to school in school clothes. You got home, you put on your play clothes. But on Sunday, you stepped way up and you dressed what? 
up for church. You had school clothes, play clothes, and church clothes. Man, now everybody's casual. I am pretty sure that any, anybody who's ever worn tattered blue jeans as an adult never had to wear them when they were a kid. I remember holes in blue, not in these my blue jeans. And when, when, when I got a hold, my mom thought that iron on patches were from God. I did not. I said, Mom, the iron's burning me. Can't you take them off? And it makes them stick to my knees. <clears throat> now everybody wants to be casual. Well, you know, it's, uh, we're, they're not dressing up. Right? It's, not a, it's not a fashion show. I don't think it's a fashion show. I don't think church is a fashion show. I'm not trying to outdo anybody. I'm not trying to outdo anybody. I just think it's the greatest place I go on this earth. Can you tell me a better place? A stick at Super Bowl? I, what's better than here? And here's what I believe. It's a simple thing. It's not, I'm, it's, I'm not even saying it's from the Bible, okay? I'm not saying it's conviction. It's how I feel. I don't want to go to church and have the best clothes I have at home hanging in a closet waiting for my job interview or a funeral or a wedding or something else that is only worldly and of importance to man. I just want to give my best to God. It is rare to find a classroom or courtroom that promotes dress as you want and drink as you please. On the other hand, it is just as rare to find a church that doesn't. I say it this way, guys. We, don't, we, we believe in come as you are, do we not? We just don't believe in stay as you are. Man, you know, when I was, uh, when I was lost, you could tell. When I came to that church, that Baptist church, they knew I was lost. They looked at my hair. They looked at my clothes. They knew I was lost. I got saved. I mean, that day, you know what you did? You cut your hair, changed your clothes, fit in. Now you got a tattoo on the side of your face. And you got a bottle cap hole sized hole in your ear. I mean, what are you going to do with that? We still believe, tell me if this is you. We still believe the presence of the Holy Ghost deserves our attempt to express respect and reverence, not because it impresses him, because it affects our own hearts and attitudes. Reverence is a fading value in America. Not because God no longer deserves it, but because of the church. No longer promotes it. Isn't that sad? I say it this way. I don't care what you say about, well, I'm not dressing up for church. I don't dress up for you. You dressed up for somebody. Everybody in this room, you dressed up for somebody. You ladies, you're going to go out with him. Man, you're looking in a mirror. You were making sure you look good. My wife, my wife, when we were dating, yes, we dated. We didn't bed hop. We didn't go to a motel. We were pure. She's pure. When I got saved, when, I, when we got married, I was a clean girl. You can call it what you want. But I was going over to her house to pick her up. She's getting ready for me. And she had this eyelash curler. <laughs> it's things like that that make me so glad I'm a man. <laughs> we just don't need the equipment. I mean, I don't even use a comb anymore. I use a washcloth. I had somebody say this. Everybody say, you know, they're talking about God, not making them say, my, there's no eraser on my God's pencil. I said, there is on mine. Because he said he got the number of hairs on my head numbered. And I said, every morning he counts what's on my pillow and subtracts from what I had on my head last night. I mean, they got to have, you know, they got to have sprays and, and uh, curlers and electric things and blow dry. I'm just growing up right through it. And, and she's clamping down on her eyelash. And she thought me hurt. She heard me coming down the lane. And she went like this. And she still had her eyelashes in that eyelash curl. She ripped so many eyelashes out of that right eye that when she blinked, she was out of sync. You guys, you dressed for her, didn't you? Yeah, I don't dress up for nobody. You dressed to impress somebody. Man, you looked in the mirror. 
You made sure your clothes were nice. You looked at your teeth. You brushed them. They might have been green, but they were light green. (laughs) How dare you dress up for a human? God forbid that I would make sure I dress up for a funeral because I want to look better for a stiff, for a dead human than a living God. Still relevant. Tell me if this is not true of your church. It's still family. Our culture's experiments with the family have left the American home in a mess. There was a guy many years ago by the name of Dr. Spock. He has since died and become a King James Bible believer. And Dr. Spock basically said this. If you spank children, it makes them bad. If you don't spank them, they'll be good. Can somebody show me his kids? I'll show them to you. They're called Antifa. You tell them anything they don't want to hear, they'll kill you. They'll show up in your front yard and chant that they know where you sleep and that they're going to get you. They'll set your car on fire. Nobody tells them no. We have got an entire generation. I'm talking, we've got about four generations who have never been told no, and they've never restricted their flesh or their will or their, or their, their spoiledness one time. Man, you know what you need to do? Nail that kid. The family has been redefined in America until it seems to be no, ab- there seems to be no absolute standard. In fact, the traditional biblical definition of the home has become the minority. Alan Jones is a preacher down in Lebanon, Ohio, and he said it this way. It's sad, but it's true. He said, our culture is so so bad that kids have to be taught what normal is. Dad and mom married. Not not a man and a man. Not a woman and a woman. Nobody gets two dads. Nobody gets two moms. Dad and mom. Dad's the breadwinner. Mom raises the kids. My mother was old world. My mom was lost. She was clean. My mom, you know why my mom wouldn't get saved? I told you this morning, my mom stepped out behind my dad to get saved. You know why she did that? Because for years before that, I mean, they got saved 12 years after I got saved. My mom knew she needed to trust Jesus Christ, her personal savior. I told her one time, she's in my truck with her. I said, mom, you know, you're going to hell. She said, yep. You know why she wouldn't get saved? Because her man didn't get saved. And if he's going to hell, I'm going through the door right behind him. But I say this, ladies, I think all children ought to grow up with two smells, two smells, food and clean. There's nothing greater in a boy's heart than coming home from school and smelling supper. And nothing more heartbreaking than to find out it's from two houses down. (laughs) You know, for two to two years, we raised our boys. We went on the road. Our oldest boy was 10. Our youngest was one. We'd leave a meeting eleven o'clock, uh, 10, 11 o'clock at night on a Wednesday night. We'd drive 100, 200 miles, pull in between two idling semis and a truck stop. And I'd scoop my sleeping kids up. I'd carry them back to the trailer. And I'd put them. We, didn't, we couldn't provide them with a home. But you know what they smelled when they got in that bed? They smelled clean. In every place that lady's lived, it smelled like food. That's what the lady is for. That's what family is. You understand? Look at your stupid commercials. Dad doing the laundry. Are you out of your mind? I did laundry. I did laundry when I was single, when I was in Bible college. Cost 20 cents to do a washer, 10 cents to do a dryer. I did all my laundry for 30 cents. <laughs> and you women never get it. You, know, you women do not get it. I'd say that, and, you're, and I'd say, women go, you put it all in? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. <laughs> the colors and the whites? Oh, all in, all in. I'll tamp it down. <laughs> And then I would pour in some soap. You say, didn't you measure? I measure how far the suds got from the machine when it was running. They got a little, I thought that was that thing on top of the machine was for. If the suds came all the way across the washer, down the floor, into the dryers, I knew my clothes were going to be clean that week. They might, I might get a little chafed, but I knew they were going to be clean. (laughs) Then I took my laundry and I put it in a dryer, I put it in a dime, and I set it on nuclear. <laughs> Took three days to get them things out. I used tongs. <laughs> but there were, no, there were no germs on my clothes. You say the heat killed them? Oh, no. No self-respecting germ would be seen in my clothes. 
poor women, they don't get it. I'm serious. I say this. There's always a woman comes after church. She goes, my, you must have a lot of ironing to do. I said, uh, uh, I, I had the, uh, <clears throat> the no iron kind of clothes. You are looking at the inventor of wash and wear. If I bought it, it's wash and wear. I made my bed one time when I was in Bible college. You say, why? Well, because I just got in, I move into a place, and there's no, there's no, there's no uh, sheet on the bed, so I put a sheet on the bed. And I put a blanket on the bed. And nine months later, I take it off. Actually, nine months later, it's disintegrated. <laughs> How did a woman say this? I, I never made the bed. Now, here's my thinking. I'm getting out of bed in the morning. I'm getting back in bed in the evening. And we're not doing tours during the day. <laughs> I mean, during this day, no one is going to hear me say, and this is my bedroom. <laughs> and I'm pretty sure after a few months, even God wouldn't walk in there. And I had a woman, don't get it, they don't get it. Some woman came up and said, well, didn't you make your bed when you washed the sheets? I said, you wash sheets. Oh, I have those new kind of sheets, the no wash kind. They were kind of chameleon sheets. Because when I put them on, they were crisp and white. And over that next nine months, they changed several different shades. <laughs> By the end of nine months, they were kind of a dingy gray with an oily spot right in the center with a green fringe around it. I never jumped into bed. I'd hit it like a lake and slap the wall on the other side of the room. <laughs> you say, you're a heathen. No, I'm not. I'm a man. That lady knows how to do it. She makes things soft and smell. Oh, so you think that's what women are for? Yep. Wait a minute. That woman has never shoveled the snow. That's what I am for. She didn't have to go up on top of our, our motorhome in 24 degrees in the wind and break five inches of ice off the top of our motorhome so we could bring the sliders out and get in, in to leave town. You say, why? That's my job. I don't think she's a slave. I think she's got the inside of the house. I'll take her to the outside of the house. That's how it works. You understand? You're going to make a commercial some guy. Oh, my colors are fading. <laughs> I had this happen. I could tell you this. I, for what it's worth, I'm in the Philippines. And um, I'm in the Philippines back in 1990. But my luggage is in Hong Kong. I am, I am holed up in a hotel with no, the windows are frosted over. And the, the, the Filipino pastor said, uh, don't go outside because the New People's Army, the communists, have put out word that you work for the CIA and they're going to kill you. Oh, this is wonderful. And I am wearing the, all the clothes I got. The, water, the room doesn't even have hot water. I turned the hot water spigot on once and something brown and oily came out. I put that back off. And there was no soap. And finally, I snuck out and I bought this. The only thing I could buy was this shampoo in a black bottle. Until I used it the first time, then I found out it was a clear bottle. And then, I don't know how to say this, guys, but I'm there for 10 days. And so, after a few days, I had to wash that which was very close to me. Okay? So, I fill up the sink with water. I put in that which is very close to me. And the only soap I got is this black shampoo. And I poured it in the water. And that's when I found out it wasn't black at all. It was very, very dark red. Pink. I'm cracking up. I am cracking up. Communists want to kill me. My wife has no idea where I'm at. Nobody can reach me. And I'm looking at pink underwear. And I am howling. I said, God, this got to be the greatest joke you ever played on me. I think this is funny. But I said, please, no hospital. Just don't make me go to the hospital and have hey, we have to see this. <laughs> a marriage with a mom and a dad whose love for each other grows year by year, surrounded by children who are happy and respectful, is little more than a fairy tale. Yet in truth, it really is more than a fairy tale. It can be reality and we still believe the key is the biblical roles for the family. Is that what you believe? 
Call them old-fashioned or timeless. The biblical plan still works when people work the plan. Tell me if this is you. Our church is full of homes of various kinds, whether starting out right or trying to restore broken relationships around the proven biblical standard. That's the truth. I was telling, I was telling Brother John today, I said, uh, our boys, you know, they're good boys. They're good boys. And somebody asked me one time, he said, boy, your boys are very, uh, they're respectful and very obedient. How did you do that? I said, well, I said, we use the same principle Tarzan used on Cheetah. A little love, a little understanding, and a lot of beatings. And it worked. I used to just say it this way to my boys. Son, you don't want to lose all your baby teeth on the same day. <laughs> my boys thought time out was how long they were unconscious. It's still church, it's still preaching, it's still men, it's still hymns, it's still relevant, uh, reverent, it's still families, it's still exciting. God doesn't need the top 40 or the latest fads to be exciting. I'm going to tell you something, you may disagree with this, but I, 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 I don't like it. I have, I have no problem with audio Bible tapes, I have no problem with somebody playing the, reading the Bible. Scorby is the most famous, right? I don't like dramatized Bible reading. I don't like it. You say, why? Uh, what's the matter? Is it too boring? You've got to add the sound of the hoofs of the, of, the, of the horses. I mean, come on. What are you? you mean the word is not enough? There's a mistaken idea these days that God needs the help of the latest fads and technologies to be considered exciting. Read that laser lights. Now, I'm going to give you guys some help here. If you ever travel and you're in some church, some, someplace on a Sunday and you're looking for a church... And here's your question. How do I find out if this church is traditional or contemporary? You ever been there? Sometimes we have an open Sunday and, and nobody wants to walk into a church and then see it's all painted black and they got the drums. And out we go. And here's how you do it. Just about every church has a, has a web page. Go to a church web page and there will be a little button that says about us. All right? When you hit about us... If it says something like this about us, we believe the Bible is the word of God. Uh, We believe that preaching is the the method God uses to reach lost mankind. We believe this. We believe that. Go to that church. It's traditional. If you go to about us and suddenly they wax poetic. Oh, we think, you know, that the service is for the family. And then we all come together to better relate with our. That's contempo. Stay out of that. The truth about him just isn't enough. It takes the latest music styles and entertainment trends to bring life to his attributes. You really think that? You think God is boring, a God that can kill everybody on the planet but eight people? You think that's a boring God? You think a God that can take fireworks and reverse them and destroy Sodom and Gomorrah, Adam and Zeboim? I mean, if you were standing there watching Sodom and Gomorrah go up in flames that night, if you could do it and not turn into a pillar of salt... You would not say, well, that was boring. If you were walking, I don't care 40 days, 40 years or not. If you were walking through the desert and every morning you were falling on the same pillar, the same pillar of the cloud and it moved ahead of you. And every night it was a pillar of fire. And every morning for six days a week, not the seventh, not on the Sabbath, there was manna on the ground. Miracle every day for 40 years. I'll bet you nobody said boring. Entertainment and true worship don't produce the same result. Once a church starts down the path of entertainment, the destination is unpredictable and likely undesirable. We still believe that church can be exciting without borrowing the latest fads to kickstart the crowd. I say it this way. Some preachers' messages are so dull that they need laser lights to add some life to them. They need drums. I got to tell you, I had this happen. I was preaching to a little church. It was a little Hispanic church. And they could not afford a church building of their own. So they 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 were borrowing a Sunday school room in a larger church. So the, 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 Large church is having their Sunday school, and, and I have this Spanish church, and we're in this little Sunday school room, and we do this. Well, then when the Sunday school is over, we move to the teen uh, uh, room. 
because those guys were all in the, uh, the main service. And I go in to preach, and I'm standing here like this, and there's these, these, these Spanish-speaking people, and right behind me are the drums. Now, guys, I take my shoes off when I preach because I'm comfortable. That's where I do it. It's not got any holy ground or anything like that. But there's also another advantage. I found out that day that if you don't have your shoes on and you're behind a pulpit and there's drums behind you, that you can preach with your mouth and with your feet. You can loosen that main drum skin. Say you didn't. You better believe I did. So you feel bad about it? Not yet. No, I just can't feel to bring any conviction. Maybe one of you women could work me over. (laughs) Know what it says? It's It's still church. Tell me if this is not your church. It is still preaching. It is still men. It is still hymns. It is still reverent. It is still family. It is still exciting. You know why? Because it's still church. I want you to stand with your heads bowed. I'm going to give you an invitation tonight. I don't have to, I don't have to guilt trip you or, or cajole you, push you around verbally. I don't have to entice you to, to love your church. I don't have to try to tell you how fortunate you are, how blessed you are. I think you know. Let me tell you what the invitation is tonight, folks. If you love this church... We give the invitation, why don't you come down here and get on your knees and say, God, make sure our church is always still church. All the things we talked about tonight, God, let them always be in this church. If we do tarry 40 years, let it 40 years from now. Listen, you understand 40 years from now on the 80th anniversary, how few of you will be here? And you say, but God, whoever is here 40 years from now, let these little children that are coming down right now, let that little girl when you put 40 more years on her, stand up in the 80th anniversary of this church and say, it's still the same. It is still church. And don't you let you be the reason this church changes because your little humanity got offended. It was preaching too long. It was preaching too hard. It was a bother. It messed up my favorite program. Father, thank you for your goodness and your grace. Thank you for local churches. And I thank you for this one. Uh, It is a friend. Their pastor's my friend. The associate pastors are my friends. But the congregation of this church, I feel, are friends to me. I want to be a friend to them. And God, I do believe that this one is still church. God, let these people resolve themselves that if anything, this church will always still be church. It'll always sound like church. It'll always look like church. It'll always have the spirit of church. God, let it always be. And if you are going to tarry 40 years and many of us pass off this scene, let who is ever in this room right here 40 years from now look back to 40 years ago and say, the crowd has changed, but the church has not. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. With your heads bowed and eyes closed, instruments play, why don't you come down and say, God, keep our church church. Will you pray it? Let it still be church.